The Fokker G1 was one of those aircraft that, despite huge amounts of promise, was never able to fulfil its potential. This was not through any failings of the design, but more that the country of its origin, the Netherlands, was not in a position to invest large amounts in its military and was too late in recognising the threat it would face soon after the G1 first took to the air. Fokker aircraft gained a formidable reputation serving with the German Air Force during the First World War. But with the end of the conflict, Anthony Fokker very wisely left that speed back to his native Holland, taking with him enough aircraft parts and manufacturing jigs to allow him to set up a new factory there that would mean the aircraft that bore his name would continue to fly. The Fokker company would enjoy some successes throughout the interwar years, mainly manufacturing civilian aircraft, but also several fighter designs that would equip the Dutch Air Force in very small numbers. Though these designs were competent and equivalent to their international rivals, none really stood out from the crowd and certainly none enjoyed the fearsome reputation of their World War I forebears. Until 1936. In November that year, at the Parish Air Show, Fokker unveiled their new design. The G1. The aircraft caused a sensation, which when you compare it to the other first line designs in circulation at the time, makes you realise how good the Fokker looked. The French D510, introduced in October 1936, capable of 250 miles per hour and armed with one 20mm cannon and two 7.5 machine guns. The Gloucester Gladiator, introduced actually in February 1937, capable of 253 miles per hour and armed with four 303 machine guns. The P26 P shooter actually introduced in 1932, but the main fighter of the United States Army Air Corps. Capable of 234 miles per hour, it had two machine guns for armament. Against them, the G1 was a revelation. A sleek, twin-engined, twin-boomed monoplane, the airplane offered the ability to act as both a fighter and an attack aircraft. Its armament also offered to be huge in comparison to other fighters of the age, with Fokker offering two options with the G1. The first had eight FN Browning rifle calibre machine guns in the nose. The second had two Madsen made 23mm cannon plus two machine guns. In addition, the aircraft also had a tail gunner with a machine gun in a rotating rear pod allowing him, him to engage enemy aircraft above and below as well as the ability to carry up to 400 kilos, that's 880 pounds, of bombs. The comparatively massive armament meant the aircraft received the nickname in French Le Fachure, the Grim Reaper. In fact, the G1 was one of a number of aircraft in development at that time that was designed to the air cruiser concept, heavy fighters intended to sweep the skies of opposition. These aircraft, the French Potes 530 series, German BF 110 and Westland Whirlwind, were generally similar to the G1 in terms of performance and firepower, but were considered critical national projects and either kept top secret or else only available for export in limited numbers at that time. So Fokker was pretty much the only manufacturer actively looking to export the new concept heavy fighter to a world that was coming around to the idea that war might be looming and that all their respective air forces might need to be ordering aircraft now. As a result, nations practically queued to test fly the G1. And it hadn't even taken to the air by that point. The prototype's first flight was made on 16 March 1937, and the aircraft demonstrated that it was surprisingly agile for an aircraft bigger and heavier than the standard fighters. The test program did not go without hitches, as a supercharger explosion in the Hispano engines almost caused the loss of the prototype. But once re-equipped with more powerful Pratt & Whitney twin WASP engines, the test program proceeded well. Even before this was completed, orders were placed with Republican Spain, ordering 26 in June 1937. Additional orders came from Denmark, Sweden and the Netherlands Air Forces. Production began in earnest and the capability of the G1 to be adapted to different roles with varied engine fittings, armament and configurations would, on paper, make it a winner. The Swedes tested it with brakes as a dive bomber and found it very good in his role. The Dutch ordered two varieties, one a three-seat light bomber, the second a two-seat heavy fighter. 
This model, equipped with Bristol Mercury engines, registered the type's top speed of 295 miles per hour, certainly comparable to other heavy fighters at the time. With the Dutch actively looking at importing much more powerful engines like the Bristol Hercules, it seemed likely that had things worked out differently, the G1 would have provided service for years, gradually increasing its engine power as the adaptable airframe was fitted with more advanced power plants. But this was not to be. Though recognising the threat of upcoming war, the Dutch government did too little, too late, to begin re-equipping their military. When Germany invaded the Netherlands on 10th of May 1940, 23 Dutch G1s were in service, plus a number of the Spanish aircraft that had been embargoed with the start of the Spanish Civil War. Of these, most were destroyed in the first attacks on their airfields by the Luftwaffe. The survivors took off and fought throughout the day against overwhelming odds. By the end of the first day, only three of the original G1s were still flying. Desperate repair attempts and salvaging from damaged aircraft to equip the Spanish aircraft meant that the G1s stayed in the flight, but there was nothing this tiny number could do to stem the invasion. By the 14th of May, the majority of the Dutch military had surrendered, and by 17th of May, the conquest was complete. Though badly overmatched, the G1s played their part and are tentatively credited with 14 kills in the battle. With the surrender, several G1s were captured by the Germans and pressed into service as trainers. They performed this role for a couple of years before running out of spares and being scrapped. However, there is one final note of defiance from this aircraft. In May 1941, two Fokker personnel were able to steal one and use it to escape to England. There it was handed over to the Philip and Powers Aircraft Company, which studied the design to see what could be applied to British designs of the time. And that is the story of the Fokker G1, an aircraft of great potential that was blighted by planning and circumstances. For sources, check out the links in the description and at the end of the video. I will put some in for a video I've already made on the Western Whirlwind and to an article where useful sites can be found. That wraps up this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you are interested in military history and affairs, feel free to check out my website, militarymatters.online. I'll put a link in the description. Also, have a look at some of the other videos I've produced. You may find something else of interest. Check out some of the links coming up.